Well, good morning, Concord, and everybody online and all of our campuses as well. Just want to say hello to you. Glad you guys are here. If you got your word, uh, turn to Mark chapter 2 is where we're going to be this morning. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And so we're finishing up our series this morning entitled High Impact. And uh, it's been a three-week series, so today's our final day for that and getting prepared for Serve Weekend next Saturday and Sunday. So Mark chapter 2, 1 through 12, if you would, stand in honor of God's word as we read it together. All right, so here we go. Verse 1, and when he returned to Capernaum, he being Jesus, after some days it was reported that he was at home. And many gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes that were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his heart, or in his spirit, that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose immediately, and he picked up his bed, and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Let's pray. Father, help us to be astounded with how you work in our hearts. And God, thank you for this testimony that we see in Mark chapter 2 of how you worked. And God, it's pointing to Jesus, uh, Father, and his Um, and who he is and what he can do in our lives. And so help us, Father, to apply your word as we leave, that we would leave uh, with the the righteousness of Jesus produced in our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit uh, through your word. In your name we pray. Amen. You guys can have a seat. So high impact is our final message today uh, as we move into next week. And so excited about this morning, excited about next weekend. Hope you guys are connected and ready to roll for next week. We don't want you to miss out on Serve Weekend. And I know some of you might not have signed up yet. And so come and see us out in the foyer of each of our campuses. You can also still sign up online. There's a couple of more projects. We would love to connect you to the weekend. So uh, in prep for the weekend, uh, we've, always, we've been talking about high impact. What can we do to have high impact, high amounts of influence in our society, in our culture, in our community that we live in here in the Northeast Georgia area? And I wanted to share with you uh, a book, not necessarily read a book, but in 2000 there was a book that came out known as The Tipping Point. It was written by a guy named Malcolm Gladwell. And the premise of the book uh, is a fascinating one. The artist and the book is a secular uh, book about business and marketing and all of these other things. But really, it also talks about sociology and psychology of of who we are. And so in the book, Gladwell uh, sets uh, sets the stage for us to understand that there are certain ideas that begin to spread like an epidemic. And then how those ideas end up taking form and taking shape and then also other people buying into those. And so he looks at market research, market analysis, um, people, psychology, sociology, and he comes up with this theory that there's this tipping point. And he says that the tipping point is 20%. And uh, the 20%, what it means is that somewhere uh, in society, when you get to a point where 20% of the people have bought into the idea Based upon his research that he did in order to write the book, he said that 20% then becomes the driving factor for the remainder of the, or the remaining 80% of the population or the group. In other words, he said, it's the point of critical mass where your idea goes from interesting to a few people to a must have for everyone. So for Gladwell, this 20% was the tipping point. And this really is not Gladwell's uh, idea that he came up with. This is also known as the Pareto Principle, where you've heard about the 20-80 rule or the 80-20 rule. And it's the idea that 20 really drive the thought and the action of the 80. And so you can see that uh, through all, out, through out, all throughout the book, and, uh, and it's built upon this idea that once you get to 20, you can eventually get to the 80. And so 20% is the tipping point. But I want to show you another stat today, and this is this one, 13.6%. And this stat is actually more representative of us in the room and us in our community. 13.6% is the, 
is the church membership to overall population where we live in the Northeast Georgia area. I got this from Jojo Thomas, who's our Associational Director for Missions. Him and I were meeting earlier this week and actually talking about this stat and talking about also the tipping point. The idea that 20%, once you can get to 20% of people, you have a better chance at reaching the remaining 80% of people when you've reached 20% of people because something happens at that 20%. But for us this morning, 13.6% is the important stat. Now, I know we can split hairs all day about church membership, like what is a church member, and people from different denomination, denominations talk about that, and how you, how you quantify that, and who becomes a church member, and, and, and we're not going to get into that this morning, but for the point of this, let's just assume that when we're saying church membership in our area, in our community, what we're talking about is people who have been baptized believers in Jesus Christ. So people who have pronounced faith in Jesus and then have become baptized and joined a church in this area. 13.6 of the population that we live in are what we would say or have what we would say a, reached a tipping point in their faith. So when we think about all these numbers, 13.6 and then also 228,000, that's the number of the people in our northeast Georgia area and our five counties that don't have a church home, that aren't connected, that haven't heard the gospel or someone hasn't brought them to Jesus and they've answered in faith to Jesus. Like all these numbers, we start asking ourselves the question of like, how are we ever going to reach all of them? And, you know, when we think about, like, our schools and our communities and our workplaces and the places that we know people are hanging out and living in our neighborhoods, and we start adding up the number of people that don't know Jesus in our area, it is a daunting task to think about what we are called to do to make disciples in, these, in this northeast Georgia area. And so, like, for, I'm just being a little honest here and transparent. When I see what we want to do and what we're called to do, I, I get a little anxious about it because that's, there's... there's there's a lot at stake. But I think what's comforting and encouraging is what Jesus also gave us in Matthew chapter 28 in his Great Commission when he was telling us, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always. The goodness is that Jesus is with us as he has commissioned us. And so that, coupled alongside of the fact that we are only at 13.6%, really gets me fired up and gives me great hope. Because what Gladwell said was that when you get to 20% of a population or a group of people, then you have reached the tipping point. So I, I, don't, I don't math well, but 13.6 is not very far from 20 so I don't know if you can see where I'm getting at, but like we're only somewhere around like kind of 7%, 6% of reaching 20% of our population in this area with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're only roughly 7% away from helping everyone in our area get to a tipping point in their faith. And I'm not saying that like this is automatic. I'm not saying that just because 20% by some guy that said it in a book or someone that wrote it that when we, re when we get to 20% like everybody the rest of the 80% is then going to turn to Jesus. I'm just saying that this doesn't seem as difficult as sometimes we make it out to seem or as the enemy wants to make us think. That we're all, in, we're, this is just all us by ourselves, Because he is with us always. And so I don't think this morning we need a list of all the reasons that we're not sharing the gospel. I don't think we need a list of all the things that we're not doing in order to make disciples. I don't think we need to talk about all the things that we're not doing, even though those things are important. We need to overcome those things in the name of Jesus for the sake of the gospel and the glory of Jesus. I don't think we need to talk about all of those things. I just think we need to see that 13.6% is not that far away from 20%. And that that would get us fired up to the standpoint from the standpoint that we would just think about 20% means that if each one of us would just look at the one in five people that we might know or have around us that don't know Jesus, one in five people is, is a start. Like if we could just help 20% of the people in our population, what I mean by our population, my personal population, my circle, my sphere of influence, if I could just help 20% of those people, that's just one, reach a tipping point in their faith, I am closer to reaching the 20% in this Northeast Georgia community because when you start making disciples and you teach them to make disciples, it's not addition, it's multiplication. 
And so we're not far away. And because we're not far away, because 20% is not very far, for us this morning, instead of coming up with that list of things that we're not doing, let's look at the things that we can do. That we would do like the men in Mark chapter 2, and we would stop seeing our obstacles and start going after opportunities. That we would stop seeing the obstacles that were in our way that would keep us from sharing the gospel, that would keep people from hearing the gospel, and we would start seeing the opportunities that we have to bring people before Jesus. And that's what the people in Mark chapter 2 did. And so the four friends in Mark chapter 2, number one, they saw their opportunity despite their circumstances. That amidst the circumstances that surrounded them, they saw an opportunity to bring their friend before Jesus. And so in verse 1, and when he, he being Jesus, he returned to Capernaum. Capernaum was really a place for Jesus as a home base during his Galilean ministry. And so he was in Capernaum hanging out. He was at home and he was there and it was reported that he was hanging out more than likely at at Peter's house. And so in verse 2, many were gathered together so that there was no more room. You guys ever been in a house where like there was just no more room? Maybe, you know, you're hanging out, birthday party, or, you know, maybe, you know, just with some friends or whatever, but like there were like, I'm the kind of person like when you start like walking around in a house and you can't go anywhere without touching someone, like I just want to take a bath. Like it just, it just kind of feels that way. And it probably felt that way then, you know, this nasty and hot and sweaty and dirty back then. And so there's no elbow room in the house so much so that like they were even out of the door, not even at the door was their room of the house. And he was preaching the word to them. Now, the word is important because we need to see that because it's going to come into play later. But the word that it's referring to is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the good news that the kingdom of God is now at hand in the personal ministry of Jesus. That was the word that he was proclaiming. And so, yes, Jesus healed people. Yes, he ministered to people. Yes, he spent time with people that were marginalized and ostracized from from society. He spent time with those folks. But more than anything, Jesus was about the word. The word, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that's what we need to be about as well. As we are going out in our communities this next weekend, each and every day as we live, like we meet needs, yes, but more importantly, we need to make sure that our good works don't cover up our good words. And so Jesus was preaching the word to them. And then they came, they being a group of four men, bringing to him a paralytic. So these four guys had a friend. Here's their set of circumstances. We've got this friend who's in need of Jesus, who's in need of healing. He needs something, and only that guy has it. And so their circumstances is they have a friend who is in brokenness. And so for us in our area and personally, like what are some circumstances in your life, in our life, in our area, in our community that need Jesus? What are areas in your life personally? What are areas in the lives of those of people around us? What is the need of those around us, the brokenness around us? Where does Jesus need to be or who do we need to bring to Jesus? What are the set of circumstances that exist? How many broken homes are in our area? How many children need our help? How many people need to hear the gospel? All of those circumstances create for us an opportunity, not an obstacle. Brokenness is just an opportunity for the gospel to speak into and for it to heal it. And so these four men saw brokenness in their friend. And so in the midst of those circumstances, they saw opportunity. They didn't see obstacle. They're like, he needs something that that guy has. Let's get him to him. And so then, number two, they seized an opportunity to be creative. So they saw an opportunity amidst their circumstances, but then they seized an opportunity to be creative. And in verse 3, they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four Men, So four guys carrying the paralytic, probably on some kind of stretcher or mat. We're not really sure what it would have looked like, but you know, you can get the idea of how you would carry someone, four people at a time. And when they could not get near to him in the house because of the crowd, remember it was packed, they removed the roof above him. So more than likely that one of the obstacles that was in the way of, this, uh, of these guys was like, we got to get to Jesus, we can't get through the house, now we got to get up the roof. That's an obstacle. We, we, so what do we do? That's our circumstance, present at the moment. Well, let's be creative. Let's get him up on top of the roof. And if, I don't know, if I'm paralytic and I'm sitting there and I'm on the bed listening to this happen, like I know I want to be healed, but like my four friends said, hey, it's crowded, we're going to take you on the roof. I'm like, I vote no, you know. And really, like we're going into serve weekend on Saturday, um, 
the, the next part is like what we don't need to do to get people to Jesus. Please don't tear a hole in a roof this week to get Jesus to people, okay? But what they did, they got up on the roof, and when they made an opening, they then let him down on the bed of which the paralytic lay. Notice the creativity that these guys had. I mean, how many of us sometimes when we see the need that's around us, the circumstances that are in front of us of which we can share the gospel with, then we really start seeing the obstacles too. And instead of focusing on the opportunity, we start focusing on the obstacles. And the obstacles cause us to go, eh, you know what, that's kind of difficult and we're going to turn around and walk away. You know what, that's going to be a little awkward. Let me turn around and walk away from that. That's going to be a little bit messy. I might have to work on that. Let's turn around and walk away from that. Those four guys could have easily walked away from that situation saying, hey, maybe another day. But they looked at it and they said, you know what, let's get creative about it. Let's carry him up on the roof and let's get him to the roof and let's dig a hole in the roof and then let's let him down. Have you ever been creative to get someone in front of Jesus? Have you ever had an experience where you've had to go a little bit outside of the norm? Or maybe this morning you're feeling guilty because you're like, I'm not being really creative at all to like bring people to Jesus. I'm not bringing people to Jesus at all. Well, then let's, let's, let's back it up a little bit and let's just start at maybe cre- being creative is just inviting someone into your home. Like, you don't, you don't have to create a club. You don't have to create a study. You don't have to create a 12-step program for how you're going to reach people. Like, maybe you just need to start practicing gospel hospitality and just opening up your home to somebody that doesn't know Jesus. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be all put together. It doesn't have to look neat and clean. But just inviting them over. Or maybe creativity means taking someone to lunch or taking lunch with someone different than what you normally do in your, in your place of work. Going to lunch with a different group of people. I know school's about to start back. Maybe it's sitting at a different table. Maybe it's being around people that are a little bit more unique than you are. Maybe creativity doesn't have to be this grand thing like carrying someone on a roof and tearing a hole. Maybe it just needs to start with being in, some, in a different place than you were before. Or maybe it's just going out of your way to serve someone like we're doing this weekend. Or like you can do each and every day. And so are we being creative in how we bring people to Jesus? Because when we see our circumstances, not as obstacles, but as opportunities, we will then begin thinking and praying about, Lord, give us these opportunities, and we will start seeing how to be creative to bring people to Jesus. And notice that when we begin doing that, we begin putting ourselves in a position where we can watch Jesus work. We're not the heroes in the story. Jesus is the hero in the story. And so in Mark chapter 2, Jesus took an opportunity to heal the man's condition. So the four friends, they brought their friend to Jesus. They didn't see obstacles. They saw opportunity, and they got creative how to get him there. And once they got him there, Jesus healed the man's condition. Verse 6. Now some of the scribes, sorry, verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith, so they lowered him down into the, into the room where Jesus was, And it says, when Jesus saw their faith, their being the group of guys, not just the paralytic, but the four friends, all of them collectively together, especially the guy that was on the mat. It takes faith to get lowered through a roof on a stretcher by four friends, right? Okay. So when they saw their faith, now don't miss the fact that what their faith was predicated upon. It was predicated upon what they were already experiencing at the house, and that was the preaching of the word. So the good news, the proclamation of the good news of the kingdom of God, that, the ministry, that Jesus' ministry is now bringing forth the kingdom of God, they were hearing that and had somewhere experienced that, maybe through someone else, and they heard about this guy, and because of their faith in Jesus, Jesus says to the man, because of his faith, son, your sins are forgiven. He got at the heart of the issue. It wasn't that, yes, this man needed healing, but more than healing, he needed ultimate healing. He, he had now trusted and put faith in Jesus, and so Jesus was going to heal the man ultimately. And so he speaks forgiveness over the man. And, and that is why we bring people to Jesus We bring people to Jesus so that they can experience ultimate healing. We bring people to Jesus. We're creative about it. We see opportunities and obstacles because we know that the one thing that Jesus can do for them is the one thing that we can't, and that's forgive sins. And so now some of the scribes were sitting there, and they were questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. But but notice what do they say next. Who is? can forgive sins but God alone 
Now, the obvious answer in the room, and the obvious answer in the room today is, who can forgive sins but God alone? God alone? No one. That was the answer. So, so at this moment, there is something magical happening, something spiritual. I don't say magical, spiritual. People are starting in their minds, more than likely, kind of getting a picture of like something's about to go down. And so Jesus perceiving in his spirit, in other words, he, he saw, he noticed something, he's like, hmm, something's going on here. He asked them, why do you question these things in your heart? In other words, these things being what I just said, the fact that this man's sins are forgiven. Which is easier to say to this paralytic man? Your sins are forgiven or rise, take up your bed and walk. Which one is easier to say? This is a survey he's giving of them and the crowd. Which one is easier to speak out of your mouth? Well, it's much easier to speak out of your mouth. Your sins are forgiven than it is rise, take up your bed and walk to a paralytic man. Because you can say that a lot easier and that person can walk away and you don't know the outcome of whether or not their sins are forgiven. So you can say your sins are forgiven, go. And you don't know what's going to happen. But if you tell someone paralytic who's paralytic get up and walk you will know really well whether or not it was easy for you to say that by if they get up and walk and so Jesus was trying to make a point it's really easy to say your sins are forgiven and get up and walk it's anyone it's easy for anyone to say that what is difficult is the ability and so if this was a movie like like some kind of episode by episode drama of the life and the ministry of Jesus. This is where like all of the music would stop for a second. And it would be eerily quiet in the room if, as Jesus said this. And then the music would begin to build softly and then you would notice the light pouring through the window of the room and the dust from the, the man's body that lay on the ground as they plopped him down in front of Jesus going through the light. And as the music begins to build, you can see the anticipation on people's faces as they are waiting for the answer that Jesus has now posed. Who is able both to heal and forgive sins? And so, verse 10, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, but that you may know. This is the whole point of Mark chapter 2, verse 12, verses 1 through 12. Yes, it is about our need to be creative and see opportunities amidst our circumstances and not go looking at the obstacles, but look at what we need to do to be creative to get people to Jesus. Yes, we can learn a lesson from that, but more importantly, what we are trying to get out of Mark chapter 2 is how does this text point to Jesus and who he is? And Mark is trying to tell us that this guy is the Son of God, the man, the Messiah, the Christ Jesus, the only one by which you can be saved. And in John chapter 20, that was why John wrote the whole book of John. He said, Jesus did many other signs and miracles in the presence of disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, these things are written down so that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that by believing you may have life in his name. So the purpose of those 12 verses in Mark and the purpose of the, the entirety of the gospel Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as well as the New Testament, and even the Old Testament, all point to Jesus. And so as Jesus says, so that you may know who the Son of Man is. I love this part. I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. It is easy for anyone to say, go and sin no more, and you're forgiven. It's easy to say that. What's difficult to do is for anyone to do both of those. And at that moment, what Jesus is doing is solidifying in the hearts of everyone around there that he is the only one capable of forgiving sins and healing someone miraculously. And he says, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. So what was, what was your condition when, when Jesus healed you? It was the same condition as the man that was lying on the mat. It's the same condition as everyone in our area of northeast Georgia that we are trying to preach to, that we're trying to minister to, that we're trying to reach with the gospel. The condition is in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 is that you were dead. The heart of the man that lay on the mat needed emotional and physical healing, but more importantly, it needed spiritual healing. And the same goes for us, is that we were once dead in our trespasses and in our sin. 
And so the condition for all of us who have come out of Jesus is one that has come out of death and into life. The old has been made new. And when you are made new, you are made new and you are given a new course. So Jesus healed the man's condition, but then Jesus also gave this man a new course. And he rose up immediately and he picked up his bed and went out before them all so that they were all amazed. I, I think somewhere like right in here, in, in, our, like in your written text of, of your Bible, I think there's places that we should put like a long space in between our, our, our text as we're reading that's just blank. That first just gives us the ability when we're reading just to stop and to think about that this was a guy that just a few seconds before was laying on a bed paralyzed. And then all of a sudden a man spoke from his mouth, your sins are forgiven. Get up and take your bed and walk. And the guy got up. That we would just pause and see that. That in the person of Jesus is fully God, fully man, someone who can heal and someone who, forg who forgives sin. And so when he heals the man, this man's condition, he gives the man a new course. He says, get up, take your bed, and, and go home. And we don't know how he did it. We don't know what the details of it looked like. But man, it seemed like Mark kind of underselled the situation here. Like Mark, did he yell? Did he scream? Did he shout for joy? We don't know. But what we do know is that all that were there were amazed. And who wouldn't be, Right? That we would just stop sometimes and just see and be amazed at the work of Jesus. And we would say the same thing, that we have never seen anything like this. And that is the point by which, the point for which we do serve weekend. And that's the point for which we go out and we share the gospel. That's the point that we're salt and light. That's the point of why we are good Samaritans in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, in our communities. is so that people would see the good works that we do and then they would give glory to to our God in heaven. And so when Jesus healed our condition, he set us on a new course, and that's our new course, is to go and to do the work that Jesus has given us to do. And so a question for all of us to think about today is, are you running the course Jesus gave you? If Jesus has healed you and has forgiven you of your sin, if he has brought you out of death and into life, then are you running the course that he has now set you on? Because when he gave you life, he didn't just give you eternal life later on, like after you die, he gave you life now. He made a dead thing come alive. He made an old thing new. He took dry bones and he hydrated them with the life-giving water of the gospel. And so when he did that, he gave you and I a new course to run. And that new course to run is that we in our area and in our spheres of influence would, do, would look at these four words and do the same thing in our life. That we would see circumstances around us and where there's brokenness. And that we would be creative about bringing people to Jesus. That we would be creative about building bridges of relationship with people so that, that we can share the gospel. So that Jesus can heal their condition and then give them a new course as well. That's the, isn't that the story for each one of us? That in our circumstances, Jesus didn't see obstacles, but he saw opportunity. And that opportunity came down in the form of flesh and a baby and he was creative any other any other manner and and, and, and then it, it included a cross if i think if we would have come up with it we would have tried to come up with it a, a a much more palatable way but he came and he dwelt among us and he lived among us and he walked with us and he showed us how to live and minister together and minister alongside of one another and then in his perfection died our death on the cross and then was raised from the dead three days later to prove that he had the power to heal your condition, your sin, and your death. He can take away. And then when you trust in the name of Jesus Christ only for forgiveness of sins, the Bible teaches that you then have a new course. You then are set on a path to pursue a relationship with God the way that he intended. You are then set on a path where you can go and recover and pursue other people and tell them about these same things. And so that's what we're doing this weekend at Serve Weekend. Yes, we're meeting needs. Yes, we're serving others. But we're looking at the circumstances around us and saying, what do we need to do? And how can we take an opportunity to speak life into those circumstances? And we're being creative about it. Working at people's homes. Working at schools. Working with community organizations. Working with, with fire stations in this area. 
building relationships with people in the community so that we can share the gospel with them, but then also maybe further down the road, share the gospel through them, and they would share the gospel, and we would make disciples. And so Serve Weekend is about our creative process to be able to jump into an opportunity for us to tell people their condition can be healed. And their condition can be healed, and then they can have a new course in Jesus. And so, will we see opportunities or will we see obstacles? My prayer is that you would take those opportunities and share the gospel this week and from henceforth. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much that you give us a new course. And that new course, God, starts now that we are put on a path to pursue you, the author and perfecter of our faith who has gone before us. We get to follow after you. And so, God, help us to, to live as messengers of your gospel to those around us. Father, there is broken circumstances all around us, Father, that need, that need your truth. So we pray for Serve Weekend coming up, God, that you would do a work. God, that you would use us. We pray that you would keep the rain away. We pray that you would help us share the gospel. Give us opportunities, Father. And if they don't come Saturday, God, that we would, that we would speak life. And that we would love in such a way that even after the weekend, God, we get opportunities to do so. To share with people that you heal, can, you heal their condition. So Jesus, even in this time now of our, our response, of our invitation here at all of our other campuses, God, even online for people that might be watching, God, I pray that for all of us here, that we would think about have we responded to how you have loved us and offered a, a gift of mercy and grace to us on the cross. Thank you for your resurrection. So right now in this time, we ask that you be honored and praised, Father, in your name we pray. Amen. So if you're here this morning and uh, you've never taken that opportunity to respond in faith to what Jesus has done for you, that amidst your circumstances, he was, he was creative and he came down and he lived a sinless life and he died your death on the cross. And uh, through his cross and through his resurrection, we are offered forgiveness. And we are offered life. We're offered, to, he would heal our condition. And so for by grace you have been saved, it is through faith. It is not a, anything of us that we would boast, but it is a gift. And so as a gift, you just receive it. And so if you've never done that today, we would love to talk to you about that right down front. We're going to have a response time, a prayer time. Also, if you're here this morning and you've, thought about joining us here at Concord and partnering with, uh, partnering with us through membership and what that looks like. We want to answer some questions about that. We'd love to talk to you down front as well. And then we've got a baptism coming up, actually two coming up at 11 o'clock. Had a couple of them last week, but if you thought about, you know what, I, I know that as a follower of Jesus, I need to be baptized. That's a, it's kind of a first step, an initiation of like, you know what, I said I follow him, but I want everybody else to know I follow him. Baptism is the first way to do that. And so we'd love to talk to you about that and set that up to uh, to connect you with baptism and get that uh, and get that going. So, whatever it is this morning that you want to pray about or talk to, we'll be here up front during our song of response. We'd love to see you. So, right now, all across the room, let us uh, stand together in a song of response.